So today we're talking a little about, about signals, signs and signals. They're called nimitta in Buddhist circles. And these are the immediate flash impressions or features that stand out for you in experience. Touch, touch your heart. Mm. And we all know that uh, consumerism produces many of these nimittas. <laughs> you know, everything that we can buy presents a nimitta of attractive, bright, you know, it's kind of an immediate hit that's irrational. It's uh, presented through, you know, careful design and uh, so on. And, I mean, we, we feel something touches us, an emitter of attraction. Um, Got a habit. We're made comfortable by that. Uh, you know, and we, of course, we see it in people's faces. We see signs of approval or disapproval, um, just in particular facial gestures or physiognomy. Um, and so this is both uh, powerful, but also uh, fairly risky <laughs> because uh, not all signs are worth following. So uh, you know, the recommendation is to um, disengage uh, from the signs of the sense world and the signs you know, beautiful body, you feel a sense of attraction or something that's causing you to get a reflex, knee-jerk reflex. Mm. And it's something that's actually much more carefully honed, carefully placed. Mm. That, you set, that you can actually reflect upon. It's not a sudden quick hit. So, you know, somebody's asking about uh, gut knowledge, you know, how authentic, what they call gut knowledge is, uh, how useful it is. So it's a kind of non-rational experience of something you, something you get it in your gut, heart, gut knowledge. Some is and some isn't. The most important thing is that it should be something you can reflect upon and Hmm, how's that? So it's not an immediate uh, call to action. It's a sign, it's a signal. And you can, hmm, wait a minute, what's that doing? Some is, and some, it's all true in a way. It certainly touches you, gets you, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's moving. Hmm. But, you know, to look into signs and, and they give you a knowledge that can't cools and steadies. So even in meditation, we can get, um, you know, things like lights and shapes and uh, sounds appear, lights appear sometimes in deep meditation. And we get rather excited about that or feel we should have these limiters these signs otherwise you if you're not getting the little light fl flashing you haven't made it as a meditator <laughs> but actually the buddha didn't really talk about this except to say you know that uh, there are qualities of brightness that do appear in the mind either in the mind's eye or just the sense of it and then one can reflect upon it and notice what's the overall effect. Is it causing fascination? Is it destabilizing you or is it steadying you? Everything we want, every sign that's useful will take you back to a feeling of satisfaction, groundedness, more completion, um, and embody you. And if you're grounded, if you're steady, not hip hypnotized or mesmerized or something like that, because this is ex can be extremely risky. Mm. So you know, just again, to, to re refer to um, some of the 
you know, recommendations of the Buddha, you see the triple gem, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, the triple gem that we take refuge in. You want to cultivate that as a sign. So it means, you know, what does Buddha mean to you? Not just mean intellectually, but actually mean as awake, trusted, uh, uh, skillful, uh, compassionate. Uh, and then how does that affect you? Do you feel brightened, comforted, uplifted, encouraged? Then it's a skillful sign. Mm. Awakening. Awakening. The idea, you know, coming out of a, of a sleepy, groggy state into something bright and clear. Bright and clear. So, you know, you can, you can begin to work on such... Um, ideas until you derive a particular sign that sits in your heart and then as you reflect upon it you feel steadied you know supported dhamma opening the way sense of um, openness this movement open aiko it's relevant it takes you further there's somewhere to go there's space, there's openness, we can move, we can move towards the good. It's not all sign, it's not all hopeless, we're not boxed in, we're not fixated, we're not condemned. There's open ego, that which leads you, invites you further. Uh, life is you know, knowable in yourself, knowable as a core quality talk today about core presence this may be something like gut knowledge this a gut knowledge of of where is your core where is your constant most constant uh intimate unintruded upon qualities so your sense of core values core presence core stability mm. so but you don't know that Mm. whereas uh, very often we're, we're taken away from our core we're taken out to the ending of our nerves into the world of the possible and the potential and out, 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 more and more, more not into something that's simplified but something that complexifies complicates, proliferates run after it, chase it, hunt it down, you know, go out, don't go back, don't return home, go out, go out, go out. And strange enough, going out takes you to a dead end or a really a, like a, uh, a treadmill. You're going round and round and round, you're, you're out, you're moving, but actually you're just going round and round and round. <laughs> and this going in takes you to an open possibility. You know, rather than closing down defensively, it's a, going to the core. The core is actually beautifully potent and open and valid. And this is where we should uh, return to. Why I use these metaphors is because this is the language of the heart. We're not talking about anatomy, like that little piece under your ribs. It's not, it's, not, it's not in the sense world. Yeah, it's in the world of the chitta and the world of the heart is a world of image, impression, feeling, meaning, such as, you know, uh, such as comfortable, uh, such as open, such as collected, such as you know, core rather than superficial. And so you need to learn this to trust this, you could call it gut knowledge, I call it heart knowledge. Mm. Um, and um, then we have Sangha, which is again one of those great uh, paradoxes the Buddha seeks solitude. Uh, so he says, you know, so you've seen the suttas, the Buddha was walking on tour with 500 monks, a great number of bhikkhus. What's all this seeking solitude? 
or they'd have a big sangha meeting where he'd encourage everybody to go and seek solitude well <laughs> and every every year he would gather everybody would come to the monastery at sawati the place was full of people all seeking solitude <laughs> So I think this seeking solitude and community is, is quite a, an interesting, um, you know, uh, uh, paradox. Uh, uh, because uh, especially since one of the most primary sign bearing experiences we have is that of another person, which can be the most uh, frightening, uh, horrifying, uh, cursing, damning, closing, uh, invasive, abusive, or the most reliable, supportive experience we have. It can go either way. Yeah. And so this is again the ongoing encouragement uh, uh, is that you know, we are in a, in a world of seven billion and rising people. Uh, no way you can avoid that. Mm. But if you find the company of spiritual friends, uh, then they, they won't take you out. They'll encourage you to be in your own presence. There will be a comforting guide to take you home. Mm. Mm. We we help to we help to take each other home. You know, we help to take each other home on a stormy night, to walk each other home on a stormy night. Yeah. How valuable is that? And how do we do that? Well, the sign of the Kalyanamita, you know, to, to 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 fight, you have to be it as well as 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 have it. And the sign of the Kalyanamita is stable, grounded, open presence. And then you, you can pick that up if you're in the presence of someone who's stable, grounded, open. You know it. You know it in your 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 guts, your body, your heart, you know it. Oh, yeah, that. And it reminds you, this is definitely a human possibility. It's livable. It's livable. Yeah. As long as we're human beings, it's livable. As long as there are human beings, this is practical. This, we can practice this, no matter what where we are, what country we're in. As long as we're human beings, we can practice. And if they're not physically present, we can remember them. Because if you get the sign, that's the that's the value of the signs is that you can store it up in your heart. You know, you met somebody three years ago, and so you recollect it, remember it, and heart remembers it and opens it up again and you get the same sense of presence stability and maybe something that maybe remember something and all this is the, the faculty of mindfulness to bear in mind to remember to so get your awareness to sustain itself around skillful signs and qualities And all this leads to, we call it uh, mindfulness, leads to collectedness, samadhi. It's collected, centered, stabilized, and comfortable. Now, the aspect called insight, which is supposed to be held in tandem with, uh, with uh, samatha, with calming practices, Insight something that could be practiced should be practiced in tandem, which is beginning to acknowledge and recognize this process, so that uh, one is made, one is able to, and encouraged to, and willing to, and knows how to just disengage from the unskillful, because you've got to disengage from the unskillful. You have to have something skillful to, to hold on to, 
right? You know, if you want to get out of the uh, uh, out of one thing, you hold on to something else to to pull you out. Mm -hmm. And so, this is why we try to feel it most important to establish that core presence, even if what you're dealing with is nothing to do with your body presence. It's a kind of huge psychological problem about another person living somewhere else who had this terrible thing happen three years ago. What am I going to do about I mean, No, you, you, okay, what you do is you recognize the sign of distress and uncertainty and, okay, what's happening? And then from there, trace it back to, Okay, I'm feeling this agitated state, unhappy, anxious state, distressed. And where's that? And then remind you once again, you get the whole picture when you feel supported rather than supporting yourself. So if you're still trying to hold it all together, that's a noble act, but it's also uh, a failure. You can't hold it all together. But your, your core presence can. So you go to that. And as I said earlier, we live primarily, generally, <laughs> from the engaged state, engaged with sensory and, and psychological phenomena, the chitta gets con contracted, your awareness is contracted. So it becomes mesmerized by that state. And in that state, we're trying to, trying to work things out. And it doesn't, that, that's not Dhamma. Dhamma, you have to come out of the contracted state, disengage, we don't shut it down or dismiss it, but you release your hold on it. Where am I? You could say, where am I in this? Where am I? How does it feel to be in this? Can I be with it rather than in it? These just kind of mental mottos, slogans. Can I be with it rather than in it? Where am I in this predicament? You know? So we're not merged with the predicament. We're standing next to it. We're not involved in the scenario. We're Oh, we are witnessing it. Where am I in this? And then can I? What? You, and so the the I that I'm referring to when I say where am I, isn't your personality, but it's your chitta. What does that mean? It means it's not your chatty, talkative uh, qua, uh, person with her or his histories, and her or his mind states you're an awareness a sensitive awareness an embodied sense of, you want to get that sensitive awareness embodied so it's then it's stabilized and you may feel your entire physical body at least you feel the energy body is there so some confusion when i say embodied i don't necessarily mean the physique or the anatomy. I mean, the you could talk, talk about your neurological system that makes it perhaps too materialistic, but your feeling of a body as a presence that is supported. It's like you're standing on the ground, that feeling. And if it's you holding it together, you're not standing on the ground. It should be the ground is holding everything and you are standing on the ground. So that means <laughs> often it, it kind of loosely works in terms of anatomy because if you continue to, to spread your awareness down your body into the ground, the, your feet or your backside, if you're sitting down and down your back, you'll get something like that. You'll get something like that and opening the soles of the feet, opening the palms of the hands, you'll get something like that sense of, instead of me clutching and holding on and trying to figure out what to do, I'm being held. 
open to it and then we'll see and this is disengagement dispassion we look dispassionately rather than frantically you know if you're you see if you're working in a hospital you're dealing with all kinds of people in damage and you really want them to be well if you start panicking it's not going to work you've got to be dispassionate in order to be compassionate otherwise it's not going to get into a you're not going to do your job properly you must know that if you work in medicine so it's not that you don't care it's just that you realize this is not just getting an emotional response it's that's required it's about getting a suitable response and that means the emotions have to be moderated to you know to steady compassionate cool quality heartful but not overstimulated so dispassion which means we're not searching for results you don't have to search for results because results are inevitable aren't they something's going to happen and you getting excited and searching for it the results will be you'll get excitement and searching because <laughs> that's what you're doing now you experiencing steadiness and compassion the result of that is you'll continue to experience steadiness and compassion because that's what you're doing it's very simple and you've got to trust that most what can be done has to be done through steadiness and compassion rather than that's that's the most useful uh, emotive quality skillful so you get a sense of dispassion and then so this is an in, this is you begin to kind of get it this is insight you begin to sense that you know the different qualities that are present you know and what they're based upon and their results you know me pushing too hard doesn't it gets results but the results are not satisfactory so you begin to learn so there is a learning process it's not just uh plunge in hold your nose and jump in it's it's a bit more moderated and and it's it's progressive you learn in time through experience you know, so we're constantly doing that this is a this is a school we're in chitta is constantly learning mm, this is a little bit no no this is too quick this is you know, sometimes it, the dispassion becomes almost fearful like i don't want to be with this i i don't want to know this I want to step back and just witness it and hope it will pass away by itself. <laughs> uh, so no, no, just come forward, feel it, let yourself feel the experience. So when if insight separates itself from calming, then we can get a rather disembodied theoretical, uh, you know, understanding which is all, all compounded phenomena are impermanent, true, or phenomena are unsatisfactory, true all phenomena are not self true and yet isn't quite engaged <laughs> you know we, we are living in the realm of the observer and <laughs> we're actually participating in life in felt life suffering is a feeling it's not just a phenomenon it's a feeling mm. now how do you what's the skillful insight into dukkha to feel it why is this difficult because normally when we feel suffering we start clamping down reacting running away blaming somebody blaming ourselves wondering what we're supposed to do why is it like this when will it ever stop what's wrong how do i make it another way it's her fault it's their fault it's the fault of something in the past it's my fault we do this kind of stuff 
so feeling but not reacting right that's we call disengaged dispassionate how is that possible because of this grounded presence which enables the emotion to arise, be agitated, be felt. It doesn't, the grounded presence doesn't move away. So it's able to allow that feeling to unfold, flutter, move through and move on. And it's important to feel feeling. but from this place of dispassion. Now, I guess quite a bit of our, our, our experience is, is perhaps just manage, you know, it's manageable, it's not a big issue, hopefully. I mean, some of it <laughs> seems to be, but, uh, you know, we feel, okay, so, you know, back in this current pandemic situation, mm -hmm. Clearly, there's the possibility of death, which is always a possible. Anyway, but now it's becoming more evident. Yeah. So, how's that? You could probably think, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, you know, life's like that. We can manage it. So, well, it means you know you you can't go out and socialize and meet your friends and so forth. Okay, I can manage it. Yeah, you know, I can talk to them on the phone. You know, have a FaceTime, Skype, Zoom session with them. That's okay. I can manage it. Yeah, I'm sure you can manage it. How's it feel? That's ah, okay. No, no, that's how's it feel? Would you like more of it? No, that called unpleasant feeling. <laughs> now, we can manage it. As a person, one could manage it. That's that's not the issue. It's not whether you can manage it or not, or whether you're, you know, wailing and moaning about it or not. Most of us can manage a lot of unpleasant feeling. That's not the point. The point is to actually know that's an unpleasant feeling. Why? Because when you, when you know the, the unpleasant feeling as an unpleasant feeling, there's the possibility to not just manage it, but to clear it. So rather than just to sort of contain it in a, that's okay then, I don't really mind, mustn't grumble, <laughs> pack it, you can clear it. So it isn't there. Mm. I was noticing, um, you know, something to give you a con concrete, ex concrete example, another concrete example. I've always had a very strong um, resistance to being. Um, contained you know <laughs> uh, and this arises from childhood experience i begin to recognize from particularly as an infant being you know put in a room on my own in a cot that i couldn't get out of so i was in a cot with bars on it so you have to you're in there all night long and it's dark and it's frightening and you can't get out you can't get out of the cot and you can't get out of the room you're stuck in this situation where you just have to basically bear it and so that would be the thing i would do i guess over i don't know how long this went on for maybe i don't know months years few years 
not from any malicious intent. I think the parents were just thinking, well, you know, the kid's crying, I need to get some sleep. He'll be safe, he'll be okay, put him in this room. He'll be all right, you know, see him again in the morning. They were not unkind people, but I don't think they, they realized uh, the effect, you know, being separated from one's parents in the dark and not able to get out. Uh, so I always had that sense in which uh, um, being kind of closed in makes you feel sort of restless and, and trapped. And so for much of my earlier life, I would always be going out, that is traveling a lot, open space, get out on the road, open space, get out, get out of the job, get out of town, get out of anything that can hold you down, get out, get out, get out. I suppose everybody does this to some extent. Yeah, and then, but you're getting out, but actually one doesn't get out of the fundamental phenomenon, the, the psychological phenomenon, you don't get out of it that way. You just, move away from dealing with it <laughs> and so yeah and so this is often the way that our, we we manage our um, um what i call it dysfunction or disorder or um pieces in us that are challenged or damaged or uh, unfulfilled we basically we we do things in our lives to avoid them we, we, we bypass them. Um, you know, we uh, felt, haven't felt very loved or warm, so I go out and watch movies, and that cheers me up. Uh, I haven't felt very uh, uh, befriended, so I go out and eat lots of things. That makes me feel good. I feel gratified. So a lot of addictive behavior tries to fill in the gaps the holes, the, the inadequacies of our, of our history. Yeah. And so we don't really deal with it. And we don't really notice it anymore because we've got various comforters and escape routes that we can use to, to avoid these things. Um, <laughs> and of course, meditation can be one of these. <laughs> uh, you know, I call it spiritual bypassing where you, Oh, that's okay. It's just a phenomenon arising and passing. We're not actually feeling the feeling. We are kind of, you know, uh, sort of um, labeling it, labeling it, labeling it from a safe place in our in our in our minds, not feeling it as an experience in our hearts. But meditation can also be the place where you actually meet these things that you've been moving away from or compensating from if you do it in the right way. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, it can be uncomfortable. So we want to make meditation, first of all, comfortable enough. You've got an you've got a, a, um, access to a place of stability and comfort mm. otherwise you can be re if you ca can't do it you, you'll be reacting again you can't help it you'll be closing things down again or running away again and that can be just endless thinking it can be suddenly getting very busy jittery things to do so you're running away this way that way doing the same thing as i was doing but you but sitting still you're still running away <laughs> And that can happen quite a bit. Mm. So it be the place where we don't, until you've got that core stability or cultivate that core stability, we will tend to divert our attention from the difficult places because we don't have the resources to meet it. Difficult places can be our experience of other people. So you know, I, like to, I like to practice on my own. That sounds good. And how are you with other people? Well, they're okay, I guess. No, how are you with other people? 
oh, people are they're just what they are. That's fine. And then I, whenever I can, I, I deal with what I need to do. Uh, how are you in the presence of others? Really, how does it feel if you pause and don't run away and don't think and don't label them? Probably a little bit nervy. Of course it is. Of course it is. Because we all know other people can do you, any of us, can do any of us considerable verbal harm. One should be a little bit nervy, I think, <laughs> in the presence of other people. It's just a uh -huh, alert, awake, and then you get the signs and the gestures of friendship or respect, and okay, in it, you know. Oh, okay, I feel okay now. So, but we get the social idea you should not feel nervy in the presence of other people, you should be immediately confident and cheerful. I wouldn't do that if I were you, <laughs> because this is where you can easily be too open. And uh, you know, just see this. So there's always a sense of negotiating contact. It could be five seconds, it doesn't have to take a long time. But you check, pause, find out where you are, don't rush in, don't pull back. Other people are mysterious. Um, and we don't know what we're doing to them either. <laughs> you know, what we represent to other people can be all kinds of things, depending on their history and depending on their what's happening for them. So we just said that pausing, respect, gestures of respect. These are not just clunky customs. These are, these are required, sensible ways of being to negotiate this territory. Look for the signs, you create the signs and you notice the signs and you know it in your body, you know the person, your body can be present. If somebody wants you to leave your body behind, leave your presence behind, come follow me, forget about yourself, don't do, don't do that. You know, spiritual abuse, we all, we all read about, don't we? People who gave themselves away to some powerful teacher who then abused them. So you never, you never leave your presence behind. If somebody says you have to in order to follow me, say no thanks. Yeah. Now notice the signs. Hmm. And how the insight observation is to, to notice these and to notice which are leading to increasing sense of dispassion and release from inner turbulence, but also release from closing down, scurrying away. Now, of course, the other, when we cultivate in our own intimate domain, every one of us comes up against uh, difficult thoughts, uh, unpleasant emotions, things we feel rather disgusted by or, or fearful of or ashamed of, or this isn't very good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm having ugly thoughts, nasty thoughts, uh, um, improper thoughts and so forth. So then I get very upset about that. Yeah. So instead, I try to put kinds of other thoughts in or avoid the topic altogether or avoid, you know, going in there altogether because my mind is so uncomfortable. Something wrong with me. No, nothing wrong with you, particularly your core presence. You have to remember that so that you can meet these qualities of fearfulness greed, passion, aversion, anger, and clear it. You clear it by taking one at a time, feeling the feet, how it feels, not 
excusing it and not justifying it or not blaming yourself or anyone else for it. This is the sign of, of hatred. This is the sign of, of uh, greed. This is a sign of guilt, regret. Okay. How is that? Can I be with that now? And what can be with that now? That's important. Embodied presence. Now, because although we, this may in some ways be slightly unusual to talk about signs, actually we negotiate with these all the time, just we perhaps haven't got the language for it. You know, as I say, advertisements and commerce present signs all the time. Anybody who wants to sell you something will present you with a sign. This is attractive. This is wonderful. This is progressive. This makes you feel good. There'll be this kind of immediate hit to it. Any politician will give you signs saying this is reassuring. This is stabilizing. This is what you need. This is I'll look after you. They give you these signs. And by and large, we follow them. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. We're convinced by them on an emotional level. And as we know, we certainly with politics we you know you get the facts are pretty dismal actually of the person's behavior and yet they come out with a few bluff statements and a few confident remarks and easy smile and a casual manner and we we buy it <laughs> just the same thing as you go into your supermarket and you see things like you know so-and-so's dog food with a happy little dog on it and you buy it you don't know what's in the can you buy the label we buy labels all the time. We buy labeled people. We buy labeled particles. We believe in labels. These are signs. Hmm? Now, there's the cultivation of skillful signs. But because, because we, we need to use that in order to, to find, to disengage something to go to, but the release is signless. That means just cessation. That is, there's no particular dazzling anything. It's just the cool releasing, open, un unoccupied. And we might say very, very uh, simply that breathing does all of this i mean does the whole uh signs and the signless so when we breathe in the inhalation comes in the really optimal and simple sign of breathing is brightening filled being fed being open, something I can trust, allowing to enter and open. It's bright presence. That's the sign of the inhalation. Sign of the exhalation, I can let go. I can just let it happen. I can release. And in between the two, we have the pause, which is signless. It's not good, it's not bad. It's not happy, it's not unhappy. It's not. <laughs> it's a lovely nothing. And yet, right, so it's, it's something we know it happens. <laughs> Although very often we, we, if you're doing mindfulness of breathing, you may have uh, not really noticed this quality. But if you breathe in and breathe out, there's got to be a point between the two. <laughs> like we're breathing in turns into breathing out there's got to be some kind of transition there and that's the open and same thing at the end of the out breath before it come in again there's an open quality and that and if you 
and your attention goes there, it's just my, nothing, you can't make anything out of it. It has no, it's signless. So this in a way is a simple um, reference to, okay, again, some aspect of our neurology, our nervous system, experience arousal, inhalation, it can experience discharge, exhalation, it can experience just open. And then, and then. Now, often when you do mindfulness of breathing, you might have one of these systems where you count the breath. One, two, three, four, which, yes, yeah, keeps you on track. But it, if you do it like that, the problem is, in my opinion, is you see each breath as separate and you don't notice the pauses. But actually, the breaths aren't separate. It's just one breath from birth to death. And that breath goes, pause, inhale, exhale, pause, inhale, 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 pause, exhale. It's one long breath for a lifetime going through these three phases. So it's not this and then that and then this and then that and then this and then that. And for, for regulating uh, for calming all those aspects are equally important and perhaps what needs to be stressed is how important the pause is because if there's no pause you're emotionally overworked you're emotionally and physiologically overstressed your system is not getting that essential open signless space and uh yeah so the pause is very significant the pause actually moderates the rhythm of the breathing doesn't it if there's no pause your breathing is going to be pretty quick the long pause your breathing is going to be slow calm and that's always considered the optimal in any particular spirituality, psychology, whatever, that the, the long, slow breathing, the cool, calm breathing is considered the sign of neurological, physiological, symbolic, emotional <laughs> health. Or every, every level in which you can measure health benefits from a pause. <laughs> in other words, to put it very simply, where you're looking at psychologically, emotionally, neurologically, even in terms of digestion, every one of those the boxes you need to pause. You need, you need that's necessary in order to get that smooth, long rhythm going. So this is important to bear in mind when you're doing mindfulness of breathing, as I hope, as I hope you do. Uh, and but not focusing on breath but on the rhythm of breathing, on the whole physiological process of it arising, moving through. And then you'll get a sense of the ability to experience signlessness without the mind trying to fill the gap, which it does by and large. You know, get to the end of the out breath, the mind drifts off, wants to fill the gap, wants to fill the gap finds the gap somehow unnerving because I'm not there. I need to fill it up with something. Yeah. That's why, of course, the process is to be a slow, coaxing out breath, just to allow a little bit more deeply and feeling your body. So there's a sense of being gently encouraged to release, gently encouraged by it. And this certainly will builds up not just the immediate benefit, but long-term benefit, because it begins to change your reflex patterns. Now, what can occur for people is that we might say oversensitive. That is, 
just gets such a high impact. Everything just, I feel really like I'm skinless. You know, stuff just goes into me. I'm feeling really, really reactive to it. And what can I do about it? You know, so we close down. That doesn't seem right either. So we go from hypersensitive to hyposensitive closing down. Uh, now, actually, what is needed is you've got to create a safe container. And then the long breathing, the full breathing will begin to build up uh, a secure uh, sensitivity. And I don't know what the what the all the details of the process in that, like what actually happens. It's not that you're insensitive, you just don't get that the chemical or whatever it is that generates those surges of feeling is moderated. It's moderated automatically, not by me trying to moderate it, not by me calming down, but automatically by the breathing body itself finds its balance so you can that, and that builds up over time that builds up over time it's almost like in in certainly in, in if you study qigong you know they talk about this stuff called jing which is like an elixir that the qi the energy builds up a certain almost the juice that nourishes the nervous system yeah so it actually is nervous system is very stable and strong it's not easily shaken and what occurs when we do high pressure stuff a lot of what they call yang which is high energy driven stuff is you you re, you burn out <laughs> you use up that that stuff and what happens is your nervous system is starved so it becomes more fragile brittle so driven lifestyle will tend to make you more reactive and you may that reaction goes two ways one is you get oversensitized and the other aspect is you close down because it's just too difficult so we get these imbalances of of reflex because the the reflexes system itself is not nourished and it's become you could say brittle um, um, brittle and uh, over stressed. It's almost like we've established the wrong standard for our, for our reflex system. We've gone into a hyper state uh, because in high pressure, high impact driven lifestyles, that's what they do. They think to affect your nervous system. So you're on red alert or perhaps not red, but sort of orange alert, a considerable amount of the time. And there isn't that sign of going into both discharge and emptiness, which is necessary, not as a thing in its own right, but as part of the whole process of health. Arousal, pause. Discharge, pause. Arousal, pause. Discharge, pause. Meditate. Pause long, lengthen, no pressure, let it go, wait, let it come in, moving slowly. And this has immediate benefits and long-term benefits. And the long-term benefit is you begin to get it in your head. <laughs> like, don't follow any old sign that comes up with flashing lights on it and bells and buzzers and flowers and flags don't follow flashing signs if it flashes it's probably a, a, a fake <laughs> something to get you reactive if it flashes don't follow it yeah there should be something where you can actually have measured attention if it doesn't allow you measured attention don't follow it whether it's a slogan a politics um, um, a visual thing a uh, consumable um, don't don't follow it and so this is wisdom practical wisdom including of course when your own signs start flashing you get the fear sign you think oh everybody hates me i can't stand it whoa, whoa, whoa. what's that one 
you know, or feeling threatened, feeling, you know, these flashing signs occur internally. They're not to be followed. They're not to be closed down either, but what's needed here, stable, breathing out, pausing, emptying, and overcoming those programs, uh, psychological programs, which say you should be doing something. I am doing something. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm relaxing. <laughs> I'm busy relaxing. <laughs> I'm busy pausing. <laughs> That's one of the most helpful things I can do. <laughs> so you get these sabotage programs saying, hurry up, come up, get the fix, get it fixed. He said, I am, I am hurrying up. I'm hurrying up, pausing. <laughs> I'm doing the most important thing, which is learning to pause. And you know, so yeah, or you don't deserve to. <laughs> Or, you know, something like that. You know, this isn't a matter of, this is just following nature. And, and beginning to really integrate that. These signs and reflexes get you on your emotional level. And we know the emotions are not just lovely, colorful flushes of warmth, they're also panic, fear, threat, pain, grief. Um, and even, you know, even the seemingly positive ones like excitement, happiness has to be moderated. You get reckless and careless. So pause will never do you any harm. It's not a closure, it's just uh, allowing things to. And then you get insight, deep insight into what has, what has moved through you. What has moved through you, some of your regret has arisen. Your feeling of made a mistake, can't do it, has risen in your atmosphere, in your intimate environment. And rather than reacting to it, blaming yourself, blaming somebody else, feeling frightened of it. Okay, this is time to breathe through that into the pause, signless, and out again. 